Hey, everybody. Go Blue. I'm back. Michigan defeats Alabama and is headed to the national championship game. We're going to dive through it all with Tony Altimore next on a special episode of Michigan Wolverines Live. And welcome in, everybody, to the show. Special Friday episode, Friday, January 5th, 2024. My name is John Diadamo, and I'm going to be taking you through the next hour or so here at the Michigan channel, the Voice of College Football, and the main channel at the Voice of College Football, and the Mark Rogers uh, X Twitter account. So we're, we're in lots of places right now. Um, but here we go. Uh, do recommend everybody uh, hit the like button subscribe, share with a friend, send this link out to the universe, to your discords, to your social media, to your Facebook groups, everywhere. Let's get this thing really uh, ramped up here because uh, we've got a lot to talk about. And if you have a comment or question, I strongly recommend you send a super chat. Um, I'm going to try to get to comments, but it may or may not happen. We'll see. Uh, we've got a lot to cover. Um, so send a super chat and you'll definitely get your question or comment. Uh, read on screen. Without further ado, we have our special guest here who uh, who hosted the Pac-12 chat show live this season um, and you know brings a really good holistic perspective to college football and uh, a friend of the show and and my friend Tony Altimore is here joining us. Tony. Hail, hail. Here. Great to be here. Hail to the victors, guys. It, it it feels unreal, and and I had to wear my Woodson jersey for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, as one bring it all full circle. So I will tell you, here's a little thing. Here's a little Woodson moment. So I was at, I grew up in Michigan. I was actually at the Rose Bowl for the national, the last national championship. Wow! And my good friend, my my very good friend, like from growing up, Casey Beidel. If you guys are Wolverine soccer fans, I think she was like an All American or something, and went on to play pro soccer. Uh, was with me at that Rose Bowl, and I just saw she and her wife are on their way to Houston right now for the national championship game. So whatever kind of like whatever those ninety seven vibes, you know, from our like eighteen year old selves that uh, she can bring, she will be bringing there to Houston for you. Uh, you know, I've been talking about it and, and yeah, obviously I've been under the weather. So people have been asking me, are, are you going to go? And uh, apparently you're looking at a grand, um, which, you know, that's not terrible. But, you know, when you have that plus tonsillitis, you know, uh, yeah, we'll have to just watch it on the big screen. But that's 18 fine. Year old, 18 year old me convinced some really nice, very, I, we, I didn't have a ticket at the Rose Bowl for the Washington State Michigan National Championship game. And convinced some very nice girl working the uh, gate to just let me slip in in like the third quarter. So oh, I just got into the go. stadium, and then my friend and I ended up on the field. We snuck in through the band as the band was coming down into the field of the Rose Bowl, and uh, we got to stay until they caught us doing cartwheels on the rose in the middle of the field. And one of the security guys was like, "You probably don't have a pass, do you?" <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a uh, top guests there, uh, top detective skills. <laughs> it was great. Um, they were cool about it. Michigan had just won the national championship, so it was all good. And, and you know, you bring up a good point, and I think that's a good place to begin. So, um, obviously, you're here to talk Washington, Pac-12, but I uh, did want to just kind of wrap up on what we've been talking about on the post-game show. Um, and I, since I missed Tuesday, uh, Mark Rogers, voice of college football, took my place, and obviously – who better? Um, but, you know, I definitely wanted to just ask you because, you know, you're you're the historian uh, of us. And so with this win, um, you know, that so many narratives were shattered. Right. Michigan can't win a, the, the postseason. Michigan can't win against the SEC. Uh, Michigan can't win a playoff game. All of that got shattered. Um, with an overtime thriller against Alabama. Do, do you think that for the program, I mean, uh, do you think that this is the most important win uh, since 97? I mean, it may be. I mean, there, there's a couple of great wins there after that, and I forget the exact years. I mean, what was it? Was it the 2000 maybe Orange Bowl? Yeah, I mean, against there's Alabama. A, a few of those games under Coach Carr that, that were yeah. huge wins. 
They were. Um, but but this was the game where Michigan came in. Uh, people kind of expected them to lose, and and they found a way to win. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it it helps that Alabama was unable to snap the ball more than what three centimeters off the ground. I don't know what was going on with that. Yeah, we'll their, take their it. center. Their center was a little off. Let's just say. We'll take it. We'll take it. Um, but but I'll tell you what what I was worried about in that game. So my very first Michigan game that I ever went to, I don't know, I was a fifth grader or whatever, uh, was the Michigan Florida State game. When Bob, which you guys probably won't remember, when Bobby Bowden was number one, Michigan was number four, and Bobby, and it was the the ascension of Florida State. It was probably the first game where it was. A lot of people believe historically it's the game where Florida State declared itself to be part of the national scene, and Florida State just came into Michigan with. Uh, Desmond Howard playing and beat the living snot out of this. I don't know, 55 to 30. It could have been 150. I mean, with how that Florida State team played. And so, you know, this was a chance for Michigan to take one of those games where people kind of expected them to lose and win. And they did. They found a way to win. I mean, your game against TCU last year, and we can talk more about this in terms of Washington because. In a lot of ways, I think that Washington is a little has a little bit of TCU flavor yeah. um, this year. But I mean, you think about your game against TCU last year; everything went wrong. Unless you are a Big Twelve fan, there's no question Michigan was the better team last year yep. in that mm-hmm. game. And just, I mean, if we were 2,500 years older, we would be making up like Greek mythology about like, oh, and Michigan angered the gods, and so they made JJ fall and threw pick sixes and just, you know, Oh, they like the guy who was in the end zone then wasn't like, I mean, just all the ridiculousness, like comedy, so special. Of, comedy of errors. Yeah. And somehow you lost that game that you should have won. And, yeah. and so you found a way to win that here. And, it, but the big question for Washington, I mean, I think, and we'll, we'll talk more about Michigan, I think is the better team. Washington's yeah. have that magic TCU pixie dust. Is it going to run out? So we'll find out. But yeah, as far as this win, I mean, to to win the national championship here, I think would be just just enormous for the program. But but I would also argue that the you know, I, and people can be mad at me for this. I would say your biggest win really since that Rose Bowl game was the beating of Ohio State in the snow. That was great. I mean, that, was, be that, was, that was a moment where you were like, okay, we're taking this monkey off our back and, and whisking it away. Yeah. Um, and th- that I think was huge. You know, this is probably that next step. Yeah. And I, it begins with the defense and, and like, this was the biggest shock of the entire thing for me was if, actually, if USC watching- was able to play any kind of defense, Washington wouldn't be here. Let me tell you that. <laughs> one one tackle. That was all we needed. One tackle. But, but Michigan's even actually, you know, we saw the 2021 Georgia playoff game, right? Where Michigan got bullied around by Georgia. There were times in the first half, Tony, where Michigan and it's especially its interior defensive line was actually bullying Alabama, storied Alabama. And that to me showed an ascension. Uh, of, of course, a program. Where Storied Alabama almost lost to Central Florida. That's fair. Yeah. And With, Auburn. Uh, Tyler, Tyler Buckner and uh, yeah, Simpson. Yeah. yeah and, 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 a ter- and I mean, rivalry games, anything can happen, but like a terrible Auburn team, an atrocious Auburn team essentially beat them sans one play. So, you know, they were. To be honest, be glad you weren't playing Georgia. And I mean, I know all the Georgia people in the comments are going to be like, oh, what if, what if? And, you know, if, yeah. if wishes were dishes, we'd have a full set. But Georgia's real, Georgia might be better than Alabama. Don't tell anybody. They look good. Um, and I will say the offense, while Alabama's defense did a great job, in my view, in the middle, especially in the third quarter, Um, the offense made plays when it counted the most, right? They had a pre-snap motion going on, especially the first couple of plays in the first half and then late in the fourth and especially in overtime. Um, The pre-snap motion was and the huddling. uh, Nick Saban actually admitted this. uh, I believe it was to Pat McAfee 
um, on the Pat McAfee show. And he, and he, and he gave credit to Michigan for confusing Alabama and like taking them off rhythm where they couldn't really detect what was going on. So that, so Sharon Moore um, and his play design Great was, coach. at times was really what needed to happen against Alabama. I agree. I mean, they, they, the, again, like you said, they made plays when it counted. Um, and, and that, that's what you have to do. Um, I mean, you compare that to Washington, right? Who had that game won and almost blew it. So, yeah. you know, yeah. Michigan was, was, was kind of the opposite, you know what I mean? And they, and the defense, the, the defense really came through for Michigan in, in such a good way. You know, you always make that cliche like defense wins championships, but, you know, as my dad one time said, like, hey, if they can't score, we can't lose. And hey, the, the, the other the, the other silver lining is special teams nowhere to go but up. Well, so true, so true for like this entire playoff, like just, oh, my God, there were there were some there were some moments. But I mean, the thing is, is the great teams find a way to overcome those moments. I mean, you had those moments when you, when you had them last year with the. The picks, well, it's not special teams, but the pick sixes and the goal line fumbles and, you know, the, those, those things happen. And they happen against really great teams because really great teams are sort of making them happen often. You know, I mean, that that's the thing that people don't always get it. When you talk, think about like fumbles and screw ups and stuff like that, people don't give enough credit to the fact that when two great teams are playing, the, the great teams make the foibles happen. Um. Absolutely. Um, and so leaders and best awards I'm awarding uh, for the coaches. We've got, of course, Jim Harbaugh, um, Sharon Moore, Jesse Minner. Uh, but somebody who doesn't get his kudos enough, Ben Herbert, strength and conditioning coach. OK, uh, I had an interview, Tony, um, for another project I was doing aside uh -huh. from Boise College Football with a freshman tight end, Zach Marshall. And oh, he cool. was talking to me about uh, how ingrained Ben Herbert is. Basically, he reports to, so Zach Marshall reports to um, his tight ends coach, but he also reports to Ben Herbert kind of simultaneously, calls him Herb. And uh, and it's, it's very much like every day you put in the work um, you, and, and you can't, you can't half-ass anything because they're going to, that not only is he is Herbert going to get you, but the other uh, your team is going to get you like, you know, to basically get you back up. Um, so Ben Herbert and what he's done the last few years, strength and conditioning, I, I think needs to have a leaders and best award and, and to talk about for a minute, because it really has. I think I think that's you know, we can talk about sign gate. We can talk about whatever, you, you know, but but having a top tier strength and conditioning coach, as Ohio State fans know, with Mickey Marotti, when Mickey Marotti came in. And and they toughened up a lot um, at Makes under Urban. Different. Same thing here. Um, and Mike Hart as well. Uh, running backs, obviously Blake Corum, um, turning Khalil Mullings from a linebacker into a running back. Uh, just some of the things that he's been able to do, top notch. Yeah, I mean they've all they've all done great stuff. It's <clears throat> it, it was a it was a fantastic game. Um, it. And the thing that I love about it too is it was a game worthy of the Rose Bowl. I mean, that was that was the thing. It was a game where it was two great teams. I mean, the essence of blue blood versus blue blood. The I, I was reading some a uh, couple of writers talking about it, and they said one of the differences between this game was that for three and a half, he's uh it was, it was, it was Richard from Sports Illustrated was talking about it. and he said one of the uh, from split zone duo podcast he was saying one of the differences is he said you know you go to the the orange bowl or the sugar and there's people milling about and there's stuff and, but he said this was for three and a half hours you had ninety five thousand people locked in to this game they were here for what was on the field and it absolutely delivered as, as the rose bowl does i mean you know i know i've been to six Rose Bowls now and they're just it's, it is an enchanting magical place that is that is unlike anything else. I've been at, been at Orange Bowls uh you know I've, I've been to World Series I've been all kinds of these games but there's nothing like the Rose Bowl yeah I can't and wait my dad to said it was like that in the 60s when he played and I can't wait to go over there uh you know visit with UCLA uh and, and Michigan okay that's not the Rose Bowl. that's in the Rose Bowl stadium 
Well, yeah, but still. Okay, wait, I can, wanted, can I tell you my favorite line from a Northwestern fan? Yeah. <laughs> a Northwestern fan asked a UCLA fan on one of my Twitter threads. He said, so when we play you guys, do you have enough tarps or should we bring some of our own from home? <laughs> anyway, I loved it. Sorry, Bruins. Sorry, sorry, Bruins. Um, yeah, and also USC will be another another good one to go to. That'll be a um, fun game. Absolutely. Uh, players. So three specific players and then some entireties, right? So JJ McCarthy, quarterback, did what he needed to do in clutch moments. Uh, three touchdowns. He, he did very, very well. Um, obviously, Alabama's defense was able to adjust in the third quarter as the greatest of all time. They're Alabama's defense. Like that, he played you know, like he needed to play. Right. Uh, Blake Corum. I, I thought he had himself a, a great game um, and they, they put him in the right positions, right? They got him out in space. They got him out in the flat to just, just run a route and, and uh, you know, doing misdirection with, uh, with Carson Barnhart as well to, to do, to do blocks and things like that. They really got creative and Blake Corum was able to really play to his strengths um, and obviously made a clutch uh, play touchdown, um, you know, to help, help get uh drive Michigan to, to the, the, to win the game. So uh, Blake Roman Wilson also uh, had a really incredible uh, catch that was literally his fingertips or it would have been intercepted. Yeah, and he was I, able oh, to that catch was... that ball. It was so close. I had to give it to him just for that, because that, that saved, you know, a, an, an embarrassing, uh, well, there were a couple of people who saved us from an embarrassing ending, but, but that was definitely one of them. Um, the O-line, which we've been worried about, uh, obviously with Zinner going down uh, at right guard, I think Sharon Moore putting Carson Barnhart at right guard, Trente Jones at right tackle, and then obviously the rest of that position group, um, they really gelled. Uh, and they did a, I thought they did a great job of protecting JJ, um, limiting pressure as much as they could. And I had to give it to the entire defense. I couldn't like think like there was just, there were so many players who were made plays that needed to happen. Uh, you know, key tackles, key moments in that game. Uh, and, and just that pass rush with, with McGregor, um, you know, the six sacks on Milrow. That's insane. Anytime you have six sacks, probably not going to win the game. Um, it's, it was, it was very impressive. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and they, 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 they did what they had to do rose to the occasion in, in the big game. And that, that I think was, and, and I mean, and the other thing too, is they sort of got a bit of a monkey off their back because I mean, the joke for 50 years has been Michigan goes and loses the Rose bowl. So, you know, getting, getting, getting that monkey off their back was a good thing. I, I've been to plenty of them. I've, I've cheered as it happened. Uh, but getting that monkey off their back is a nice one, too. Absolutely. And uh, bef uh, before we get to what you all came here for, the uh, the Washington Deep Dive, we do want to remind everybody when you're doing your shopping on Amazon, click the links so and Mark Rogers can get a couple of bucks. And what's wrong with that? We're all doing our shopping and our New Year's and everything else. And uh, so go ahead and do that for us. Um, we would really appreciate that. Hit the like button. Um, if you haven't joined our Patreon or YouTube membership yet, we strongly recommend that. And by the way, we have some new merch, um, including dog bowls, including uh, puzzles, including uh, like voice college football socks. There's all kinds of merch going on right now. So, uh, so check it out if you haven't already. Uh, there's something for the whole family, uh, friends, neighbors, ev everything. Um, okay, here we go. So coming up. This Monday, 7.45 p.m. Eastern kickoff. I just saw that. Uh, it's been reported a couple places. So if you're waiting, 7.45 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so that way you skip through all the, the fluff, the beginning. Set your alarm right for there. You'll get to kickoff right away. Um, Michigan favored by four and a half uh, versus number two, Washington. And before we get to like really diving in these two teams. I had a big picture topic I wanted to pick your brain about, Tony. All right. Um, because we, we've heard all season from various people uh, that star rating recruiting was the end-all be-all of, of, you know, 
what makes a good team. And we talked about all the different teams in the past, the Georgias, the Alabamas, with the stockpile of five stars. Um, but in this national championship game, we have a grand total of two five stars in, combined. And it's JJ and uh, Will Johnson. That's it. Um, so, Tony, do you think that with NIL and Transfer Portal and all of these things that are happening now to entice players to stay for player development, do you think we're seeing a bit of a changing of the tide, so to speak, or a, a turning of it? Or do you think this is kind of just a fluke year for the national championship? Well, I, I think there's a little <clears> bit, of, a couple of, this is my personal opinion. I think there's a couple of yeah. different things going on. The first one is, by the way, those people that do those talent rankings are not all seeing gods. Mm. They don't always know exactly how good these kids are. I mean, how many, you know, five star, I mean, how many Tate Martells are there of the world? And so, you know, are they hit or miss? Yeah, they're hit or miss. They miss some, they hit on some. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to look at like talent also evolves. One of the things that I think is an issue sort of in, in this era of these star ratings, right, is, you know, they pick these kids at like 14 and they knight them at age 14 and then they rise from there. You know, you think about a kid like let's look at Jackson Dart, who was the he won the Gatorade like national player of the year, but really didn't take off until his senior year. And so people mm -hmm. poo pooed him. Kids should have been a five star. He was national Gatorade national player of the year. But they, they poo pooed because they all had their eyes on, you know, the, the kids that they had anointed at age 14. You know, oh, the seven on seven camp with 14 year olds. So I. I do take with a grain of salt those rankings. But what the transfer portal era and the NIL era lets us do, I believe, is it lets us kind of narrow things out. Now, if you go back, by the way, and by the way, nothing is new in college football. So when we think about like, oh my gosh, it's 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 taking talent away from the big teams. Daryl Royal and uh Bo Schimbeckler and uh Tom Osborne. John McKay, John McKay supposedly used to just fill up the USC football team with anybody he was afraid UCLA might get. You know, Bo wow. Schimbeckler did the same thing. Daryl Royal did the same thing. Tom yeah. Osborne had like oh, 800 walk-ons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that, the that, oh, the talent is now kind of leaking out of some of these broader programs is exactly the same discussion they had when they said you have to go from unlimited scholarships or whatever they were to 85. Um... And also, by the way, things used to be college used to be a lot cheaper. So, for example, the University of California was free. So it was easier to, like, you know, get kids to come. So none of this is new that talent is sort of democratizing a little bit. And I think that that's a really good thing. And what the transfer portal era lets you do is it lets you take kids and, and move them around, maybe find a better situation. I mean, a lot of these kids, you know, what, whatever it is, whether it's scheme, whether it's coaching, whether it's whatever. And, you know, sometimes whether it's a football player whether it's us in a new job whether it's a dating relationship whatever sometimes you just need to start over and so you look at a guy like michael Penix jr like look at yeah. bo nix you know just to be like okay you know what i'm going to get out of there i'm going to go to somewhere new we're going to sort of start over we're going to reset it's maybe a better fit um and you you get that opportunity and i think that that is a really you know kind of a good thing that we have going on right now it also lets teams fill holes more quickly you know let usc fill the hole with jordan addison you know that you got caleb williams you got you got the pieces that you needed but i think there is very much something to be said for you know having those having that talent now you can debate whether you know jim harbaugh's evaluation of talent is better than that random guy in a basement who assigns star ratings for fill in the website um Again, I don't know. Is Jim Harbaugh a better evaluator of talent or is that guy? It, different people may have different <laughs> opinions. I'll, I'll be That's honest. True. It's a purple coin. But, but I mean, you, you have that question because there are coaches who, you know, who can do that and who can look and be like, okay, that's what I need on my team. I need that kind of kid. I need that guy. Um, I mean, we, we looked at, you know, you, you see, I'll, I'll tell you this as a USC alum, who we've had some phenomenally – quote, talented guys who didn't work out. Um, right now, we're looking at five-star quarterbacks going to the G5s. Why are they going to the G5s? Because maybe they weren't as good. 
Uh, I mean, look at look at USC right now, for example, um, where Miller Moss, uh, you know, sent the five star packing essentially. Now, Miller Moss was people people forget. By the way, Miller Moss is not like I mean, Miller Moss is a wonderful. He's like a student leader, he beloved member of the fraternity, you know, all this stuff. But people forget he was a high four star, like one of the top ten quarterbacks in the country. We come out of high school. We we act like he came out of nowhere. He he did not come out of nowhere. Um, but you know that that kind of talent, and I, I think is something that that is changing, is democratizing. Yeah, and so scout. I think scouting and and like going beyond just using two four seven as a shopping list, and actually like looking at somebody like a Josiah Stewart from Coastal Carolina, who yeah. made incredible play um, in the Bama game, and like that's that's the ty- type of thing. Like maybe without that play. Maybe it's Alabama versus Washington. I mean, this is what I'm saying. Like, I think that there's just the, recruiting and star ranking is a data point. It, it will be a data point, And I exactly. respect that data point. But I just I, I'm glad that we're coming to a realization now with this national championship matchup that there may be more to it. Well, and also and I mean, PFF does some of this, too. Right. But like what you are at 18 is not who you are at 22 after three years right. of nurturing and grooming and all that that just there's a difference for the, for those kids that i think is huge and is is underestimated oh he was a five star uh, maybe but you know this kid this kid got better you know this kid got taller this kid got bigger this kid got slower this kid never really healed from an injury you know i mean there's a lot of things that go on in there that i think really change that absolutely um so neither of these teams Tony have been to the national championship game uh, in the CFP era. Obviously uh, Washington did go in uh, 2016, I believe against Alabama kind of got stomped a little bit. Um, And then of course, Michigan has been twice before and embarrassed by Georgia. And then uh, the, the disappointing TCU that, you know, clown show. Um, Also, I want to, yeah, uh, yeah. So the last, uh, the last national championship then was before the national championship game even happened. Uh, so ninety-seven Michigan, uh, ninety-one Washington. Um, so what do you think that means? I mean, just from a, just just from like looking at this game, um, you know, somebody is going to win their first natty in wow. three decades. I think it's good for the sport. We need we the the you the national championship should be won by more than five teams, and so I think it's good for the sport that one of these teams is gonna is gonna win it. Um, I mean both, and let's let's remember some 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 folks who are younger may not understand like, and, and you know as a Trojan I don't necessarily like this, but the the way the old Pac-12 used to work was that and I'm trying to think if the the Big Ten doesn't really kind of have this sort of mindset. But Washington ran the North and USC ran the South, you know, almost like a Game of Thrones style. You know, you've got like the Lannisters and the Starks or whatever, and they both kind of rule their little fiefdoms and it works out. It works. Just yeah. sort of works. That's how it was. But then, you know, Washington spent so far down. They had their probation in the 90s. They struggled with ups and downs. They had their winless year. You know, So, so having Washington back is good for the sport, I think. Uh, same with Michigan, you know, having Michigan back is good for the sport. You're also talking about, and and people will tell me that this doesn't matter, but I think it does. You're talking about two great universities. These are world-class great universities, Washington and Washington, by the way, if you guys, those of you guys who follow global rankings, Washington is like above Princeton in the global rankings. Washington is an outstanding university. Um, I have exes from there. I have friends from there. I've yeah, you know, been out of their campus. It is a beautiful place. It it is what, especially when the cherry blossoms are going. It's one of the most stunning places I've ever been in my life. It's gorgeous. Um, you know, Michigan, obviously, a great school. They both have huge healthcare systems, huge hospitals. Sure. Um, why? I, and I've said I've said this for John probably knows that some of you guys may not know. I've said for years, Washington is probably the most Big Ten like school that wasn't in the Big Ten. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember on Mark's show, the day USC and UCLA joined the Big Ten, I said, I, I would expect Washington will join. I was surprised I they remember. didn't take Washington at the time because Washington is a very Big Ten-ish school. I mean, and they've got they've got the dog and they've got the band and the tradition and, 
it's just it's a great place and so i think having one of these two having both these two schools together here really creates a win-win for the sport it creates a win-win for the conference i I wish it was sc instead of washington but uh (laughs) i think it's a good thing overall for the conference and the school so Tony, uh, you know, for for those who are Michigan Wolverines uh, watching, obviously it's Michigan Wolverines live. So so we try to understand when we think of uh, teams to compare twenty twenty three Washington to. It's very difficult to do that when you have a Big Ten schedule where it's very heavy on top the level Iowa. defenses, but then you have offenses that are struggling. Right? Um, I had to go back to twenty twenty three Ohio a flip. State. Yeah. Um, I had to go back to 2022 Ohio State. And Tony, what happened, as, as you probably remember, there's a thing called 2020, and Harbaugh won two games. And, I, re- uh, I remember. And, <laughs> you guys, and, you guys uh, forget, and, I'm from Michigan. So I'm watching this. <laughs> People think of me as the USD person, but I'm from Michigan. I'm watching this. I'm like, oh, that was not good. And, and he calls his brother. You know, he takes a 50% pay cut. He calls his brother, and he says, you know, hey, can you help me out? Uh, you know, I can give one. And he says, I can give you Mike McDonald or I can, or I can give you Jesse Minner. Okay. I'm going to pick Mike McDonald. So Mike McDonald comes to Michigan and, uh, gets rid of the one trick pony, uh, Dr. Blitz. And it turns into a four, three multiple, uh, defense where it's a Raven style defense, um, that's built to beat a team like an Ohio state with a high octane pass, um, that's kind of like a hybrid and, and what air would that be like? pseudo area finding and having a terrible defense and then bringing someone in with a Harbaugh style defense who would do oh wait USC just did that okay sorry there it is there Go on. <laughs> yeah no I think, that, I think that's actually a pretty good analogy you know one of the differences though is that Washington has probably no offense to Texas I don't think Washington has faced a team like Michigan yet I mean, USC Washington game, guys. You could take like seven on seven on zero. It was, you know, like a seven on seven. Well, imagine a seven on zero. Well, like z- two tackles in that whole game, I think that were ever that yeah. were made. Um, yeah, Washington had I don't know eight thousand yards of offense. Uh, Alex Grinch got fired the next day. Like it was, or day and a half later. No, it was the next day. It was the next day. It was the next morning. Um, I mean, it was a sad display when USC played, but they've, you know, they've had these games back forth. They haven't played a great defense like yours. They've played great. They've played offenses that were better than yours, um, but they have not played a defense like yours and they're not perfect. Um, However, they are enchanted. So I think much like TCU last year, they, they remind me a lot more than anything else of TCU last year where they have big plays, they're going to hit you with explosives. You know, uh, Adunze is going to do his thing. He, the, the other receivers are going to do their thing. Dylan Johnson, I don't, and I don't know if he's as, if he's hurt. I don't know what's going on with him. They've heard different things, but he's a great running back. So they have explosive plays they can make, uh, but they haven't played a defense like yours that can stop those explosive plays. As you've shown yeah. against Ohio State, I think as you showed against Alabama. Alabama. Um, you know, so the question is, do they have that magic pixie dust like TCU did? Because they've had it so far. I mean, I, I talked about a good friend of mine who four year letter winner and track from there. And every week he'd be like, we got lucky. We got lucky again. We got. And, you know, at a certain point, you're lucky 13 and out. Again, pretty much like TCU last year. They so many games they should have. I mean, this Washington team should have lost to ASU, which yeah. I don't know if you guys know this. Washington hasn't won in the desert. Since 2001. Wow. 2001 is the last time they won in the desert, and they should have lost at home to Arizona. They're just, they are cursed against Arizona State. Um, oh, we're talking like Pokemon, Tamagotchis. Oh, like on like some little <laughs> chain battery powered thing. You know, that's the area. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking like the Clinton administration here is when they last won in the desert. So it's just a, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I guess it would have been the first Bush administration. Yeah. The world trade center was probably still up. I don't know what date the game was, but it's just a different. So, you know, they should have lost ASU. If USC had made, I don't know, two tackles in the whole game, we might've won. There's a bunch of different games that they pro they should have lost to Wazoo. They should have lost. A lot of people think they should have lost to Oregon twice. 
but they find a way to win. And those those teams, by the way, are dangerous. Those teams that just find a way to win. Like, like I haven't watched a Michigan game this year. I guess the Alabama game. The Alabama game is really the first one where I thought you guys had to find a way to win. Because you've you right. you you have a great team, and so you've just kind of you know continued Bow to steamroll up. It wasn't no no games were like down to the wire. Like they had a bunch of games, so that for a team that's a that's it's both good or bad because it's a recipe for you know you could be you could be the team to hit them like Georgia hit TCU last year and be like okay you're you're all done with that Cinderella pixie dust. Or, you know, you could you could be like your game against TCU last year if they still have that magic enchantment. It 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 could go either way. Um, and we're gonna dive into it uh, in six. I, I basically picked six different aspects, um, kind of carving up the stats and looking at these teams. But I want to make one caveat before we do we go through these six is that these are two diametrically opposed basically team philosophies. So it's very tough because there's no control mechanism. There's no constant. Uh, Washington's a high, high octane passing offense. Michigan's a pound the rock, you know, old school bow eighties, like, you know, with some variations and some play action and things like that. But, you know, it does make it a bit more difficult, um, you know, to look at these two, but uh, so starting with coaching um, and, you know, Jim Harbaugh, Kalen DeBoer, um, first of all, b- before I go into it, I, I, I do have to say Kalen DeBoer and the coaching job that he's done to turn around a dumpster fire program, four and eight program, and they've gone t- 25 and two with a national title appearance. Um, that might be one of the most impressive coaching turnarounds I've ever seen. Um, it, there are very few like it that just happened that quickly and go to that level. Harbaugh kind of did it, but he went to 10 wins. He didn't go to the net. But you know, you know what Jen, what Jen Cohen said when she hired him? Yeah. So people don't know that uh, people weren't really paying any attention because mm-hmm. Caitlin DeBoer got hired. I think the same day Lincoln Riley got hired. And so the me- the media was, was focused on it and, and it was kind of the opposite because what Jen Cohen said for, she wanted for Washington she knew they needed a heavy rebuild. And Jen Jen Cohen, by the, who's she was the Washington AD, she's now the USC AD, and she is amazing. Um, but what she said is she wanted a coach who knew how to win as a head coach at all levels. And if you look at Kalen DeBoer, I mean, he went back to, I don't even know some of the, what are they, like NAIA, Division II school, you know, worked his way up, you know, at Indiana, and then took over for Tedford at Fresno, at Fresno was just winning like crazy. I mean, went down to the Rose Bowl and beat UCL beat UCLA and and was just and so Jen Cohen was like, I want a coach who's won, who knows how to win. It reminds me a little bit of like Indiana's new hire with Signetti. You know, like get a coach who knows how to win at every level. And you know, brought him in and he has just done amazing. So now again, Washington has Washington has every advantage in the world. It's just, just like Michigan, it's a very big tennis. Starbucks school. Like, money, all kinds of Boeing all. money, all kinds of money. Gold. Washington has gold 100%. money. Uh, yeah, Washington. I don't know if you guys know. You know all the skyscrapers in Seattle. Washington owns a whole bunch of them because they're built on their old campus from when they moved at like the turn of the century and still own downtown Seattle. But like, like the university district or whatever in downtown Seattle isn't where the school is. It's where the school was, and now the school owns all that. It's like. You know, it's it's like we're talking like like British like Grosvenor money, you know, kind of a thing that that school has. So it's a it's a, it's a school that just has has every reason to win, and she helped you know kind of re-enable that with 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 hiring him and the, the people they put in place, the team they put in place. They you know, got people from the transfer portal, uh, and they did what they needed to do. So it's just Washington should win, and they are. But but Kalen DeBoer was also sort of like the perfect person for them. He kind of embodied that spirit of the school. Um, it reminds me a lot of kind of like how Pete Carroll. But you guys remember Pete Carroll like felt like USC, and I think Kalen DeBoer feels like Washington. Harbaugh feels like Michigan. Absolutely. Um, and you know, people are saying in chat, well, actually, Harbaugh has this record and DeBoer has this record. I took out everything except for the school, the, the school that we're focusing on. And the reason is because Harbaugh's got NFL 
He's got two, it's a couple other schools. DeBoer has got th technically three national championships at the NIA. It's very tough to like do this. So I just stuck to the one school that each of them have been representing, um, you know, and, and done it that way. But they're both I have doing to great, say, Tony. And, and you may call me a homer for, for giving Harbaugh the advantage on this. I mean, I'm from um, Michigan, but so I'm not. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm giving this this on this number one advantage Harbaugh sl at least slightly. Um, and here's why. Uh, what we saw this season. Connor is, Stallions. No, I'm just kidding. Connor Stallions. I'm no, but kidding. Harbaugh was out for six games. And the team continued to win. Oh, not only did, not only did the team continue to win. Let me tell you what I think is the masterful coaching job here. They somehow had a coach suspended for half the season for two different yeah. cheating situations. Which I mean, in both of them, you clearly did. Like shame, shamefully did. You did both of them, and somehow made yourselves the victim to where the Michigan is like the underdog. Oh, we're we're against the world. I'm like, you're not against the world. Like what a brilliant coaching job. Brilliant motivation America's job. Team. America's, America's team. team. By what metric? I don't know, but it worked. Like, you know, that get that that is a there is a masterful coaching job there. There's a, a unified team there. You know, they're all about it. I mean, the other thing, one of the things I love, and I don't know, is this a new thing in Michigan? I don't know. They call themselves, I don't know, team 140, whatever they are. What what, what number are they this year? The 140th team, 145th team. They're President Ono calls them that. There. Yeah, they all call it. It's, but they're like they're very unified in the idea of being a Michigan team. And so, you know, I look at that and and I'm like, this is a, this is a team that very forty four they need to do. One forty four. That's what they are. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, that's like a really to me, that's a really cool thing because that's like a te the team doing that and the team calling themselves that, which they do. They're recognizing their place in Michigan history. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> we do have our first super chat. Thank you to Ryan for your 999 super chat. Go blue, get the job done, bring the pack in with a win. Okay. I like it. There you go. Um, hey, the Big so Ten number wins one, either way. Exactly. It's either current Big Ten or future Big Ten. Either way, the two are it's all Big Ten. You know, going to rematch it's, in the it's, Big it's Ten. All next big year. Ten. As, I told, as I told somebody today who was mouthing off of me, I said, no. The Pac-12 is it's now down with a Titanic sub, imploded and gone. It's Big Ten from here on out. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna yeah, the people in chat, we're gonna stay away from uh, talking about the the we we've talked about the the stallions thing like for hours and hours and hours and hours. Oh, sorry, and hours. I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to go there. Yeah, well, I'm just talking about all the chat stuff going on. I mean, we can debate that we could debate that for for hours. Um but uh, but the quarterback battle. So, you know, I think I think on first glance, people who may not be as ingrained in this would say, oh, well, Michael Penix, he's thrown for 100 bazillion yards. He's he's the definitive, uh, uh, you know, advantage here. But you look at J.J. McCarthy. And again, this is where the systematic differences come into play. Uh, Penix doesn't have the same running game. Uh, the, and the same offensive philosophy, it's a lot on him, right? He has three exceptional wide receivers. Um, he's got to throw a lot of yards because his, his he's got, I, I believe it's the hundredth running offense in the country. So when, when you have the hundredth running offense in the country, you've got to throw a lot. Who, by the way, had one guy run for 250 yards against USC. Well, so so then, if you had Alex tackle, they'd probably be the 120th. That's you're definitely right. Um, they'd be the 120th. But, so so these two, obviously, yeah, I I will give Penix every kudos for his passing ability. Some of the passes that he made against Texas, some of them were against wide open receivers, but some of them were tight windows, um, well defended, and he still found a way to get it in. Um, we played him uh, in 2020. We're bringing back 2020 again. Uh, when he was at Indiana, he he did, I believe it was 350 and three touchdowns against Michigan and Don Brown's final year. And so, um, you know, this is the second matchup, Penix versus Michigan. 
Um, and his QBR is is decent, uh, sixth in the country. Thirty five touchdowns is is awesome. But but I want to talk about McCarthy's strengths too. So JJ McCarthy, keep in mind he was injured for four games, right? So he was working through an injury. Um, he's he's dealing with a much more run heavy offense, but he can run the ball. He's got that dual threat capability, and he did go for. Uh, 2,800 plus yards. He did go for 22 touchdowns, uh, four picks. And because of the ability that he has, that's why he's third in the country for QBR 89.5. Um, he has the ability to run when he needs to, to, um, to make athletic plays that no other Michigan quarterback I've ever seen has made. Uh, the flea flicker in the Alabama game when he caught the ball with one hand and then quickly had to adjust before getting trucked to then chuck it over to Roman Wilson. Uh, literally, if he wasn't one of the most athletic quarterbacks I've, I've ever seen, that was Mahomes. That was a Patrick Mahomes-esque. Very few quarterbacks can do it. Um, I'm calling this a push. I'm calling this a draw. I think they both have exceptional talents in different areas, and they're both going to have themselves one hell of a game. Uh, what, what's your take on the, the, the QBs? So, I, I mean, I think Michael Penix is more talented just from a pure. I mean, Mike, Michael Penix is going to have a longer career on Sundays probably, but mm-hmm. but that's not everything it's about. So, you know, I mean, I, I would I would say I would give the you know pure quarterback advantage to Michael Penix. But it's about running the ball. It's going to be about running the ball, and it's going to be about can you complete those passes? Can you get those balls that the ball to those receivers? How covered are those receivers? How good is the Michigan defense going to be? I mean, remember one of the things that Michael Michael Penix played against some awful defenses. He played against some good defenses too. I mean, we, the the pack is not the you know mid two thousands Big Twelve, you know where you had those like every game was forty eight to forty eight or whatever, but he played against some good defenses, but I don't think he's really played against a defense on the caliber of Michigan yet. And so, you know, when we think about like, yeah, I give the quarterback advantage to Washington, but I don't necessarily give the whole, I don't give the whole team advantage to Washington. Yeah, that's, that's a fair take. Um, Yeah. And uh, as, as we've said, the, the only way to, to win a national championship, Mark Rogers and I have talked about it on Michigan Wolverines live before, you need to have good quarterback play. Penix and, and McCarthy, and both, I think both. And they both, both have elite quarterback play, I would say. Yeah. Like, I, w- I would um, say JJ, JJ is a, J- I mean, JJ is going to play on Sunday. It just, he just, you know, he may not play as many years or start as much, but he, he will, he will have a great successful career. I mean, again, these are, these are great teams and great players. I think they're going to, we're going to have a great game. Absolutely. Um. So the next is kind of, Uh, What we're going to do now, these next couple, uh, offense, defense, special teams, we're going to start with overall each one, and then we're actually going to look at the matchups against each other in terms of Washington's offense versus Michigan's defense, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to carve this up and look at the pro football focus ratings uh, for each piece. So um, offense. I was actually surprised Michigan was this highly ranked. Uh, I, you know, it, you think of Michigan's offense, you think of run the ball, you think of, uh, you know, light passing, um, but they're up there and they've, they've, uh, they've had some dynamic plays this season uh, with play action, with rollouts. Uh, but, you know, Washington, as I expected, uh, is, is a bit higher third, um, and this also does speak to Michael Penix because to have the hundredth rushing offense in the country and to still come up third in pro football focus is extremely impressive. And I think that that's why we've got to really watch out, uh, for, for Michael Penix. So advantage Washington there, uh, Tony, I, I would agree with you, but I would also add two, two caveats to this. And I don't want to sound bad in both of these. Um, and I'm a, including my beloved alma mater in one of them. Michigan played a lousy schedule of a lot of bad teams. So I think a little bit of what we think about in, in terms of Michigan's offense, maybe sometimes being a little more boring or run the ball. It's because they didn't have to, they were stomping on teams. And when you stomp on teams, you don't have to make heroic quarterback plays because you're winning, you know, 48 to 10. And so there were a lot of games where I think like, it's not that Michigan couldn't be more high flying, but they didn't have to be. 
And so I kind of give I kind of think that Michigan in some in some ways may this is gonna sound really stupid for me to say, but I, I think it's true. In some ways, I think their stats may be a little padded, but I think their capabilities are underestimated. Because I think they can do more than they're getting credit for by some people. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would. The, the only thing I would say is like I don't think necessarily that Washington played a murderer's row either. Well, no, well that's why that's um, what I was just about to get to. Washington's <laughs> offense is padded by playing some atrocious defenses as well. Right. You know, just covering no one. I mean, and, and Michael Penix, great, great quarterback. I mean, he is exceptionally talented. But, I mean, let's just pick on that SC game where, like, zero tackles were made. If we were playing that game still, it would be a hundred, hundred, eleven billion to eleven billion and seven. So, you know, it was just those, those are, I think that both of those numbers in some ways are padded by bad defenses, but that is not shorting their capabilities. Both for both, for both teams. Because I think they, they they both kind of again Washington kind of had it because they were playing bad defenses. Michigan I think had it because you know they were just up a lot. And so you know can JJ I think JJ can make plays. He just a lot of times hasn't had to. That's a, and that's a good that's a good that's a good problem yeah. to have. Yeah, you, because you know Penn State uh, there were two attempts at passing. They did an RPO and he decided to run it, and then the other one got called back. So then they wound up just uh, every recorded play was a run. Um, yeah. So if you don't want, have to do it, I mean, why that's the not? thing is, you know, it's it's not that they can't. It's that I think sometimes they haven't had to. Um, real quick, two shout outs. Uh, this is my mother uh, in chat here. So she uh, she uh, sit, yep, Lady Lake Music, uh, who also uh, helped us get our intro song. Uh, so David Martinez. Your intro song is good. Uh, thanks. Um, so David Martinez uh, donated our intro song, uh, which was very exciting. Um, and Rob, who also is part of uh, the Lady Lake uh, PR kind of world, is also here. Uh, so Rob is uh, is opening up a sports store, actually. So, uh, so cool. it's very exciting. Nice. Uh, so very cool there. All stars. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Um, so we're here's the uh oh moment for Washington. Um, so we've pro football focus defense now, uh, Michigan number one versus Washington 37. And if you look at ESPN, FBI, it's, a, it's 40 something. Um, this is where, and you saw it in the Texas game, uh, right in the, in the playoff game, um, Texas like pounded the rock down their throat. They passed pretty much at will. Um, and they almost won that game. And if it wasn't for, you know, that last play not happening, Texas would be here, not, not Washington. So, um, well, did, you know, I, the, I heard a rumor. The, I didn't, they, didn't they turn the last two minutes over to Cristobal to call the plays that it's, it's very possible. That's what I heard happen. <laughs> they were Cristobal. They were Cristobal. The too much Oregon, Oregon somehow got that Cristobal juice into their the juju into the Washington. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right in here. Michigan has a tremendous defense. Big advantage, big, big advantage of Michigan. Washington's defense has has survived on a, I don't want even want to call it a bend, don't break, break less than the other team. You know, I mean, that, that that's kind of what they've done uh, a lot this season. They, again, found a way to win. Uh, I mean, they found a way to stop Bo Nix just enough to hit a field goal to win. Right. Three, to three times, by the way, you know, last year and through this year. Three times they've beaten Bo Nix by a field goal. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing where uh, now Michigan, Michigan, I don't think has done that. Michigan just stops people. And, and that's, and again, that's the kind of thing, you know, could Washington hang, can they hang in enough? Yeah, maybe. Will they? I don't know if I'd bet on that. Yeah, whether you look at the the interior D line, you look at uh, Michigan with uh, with Chris Jenkins, uh, you look at um, Mike Morris, you look at uh, the secondary and the safeties. Uh, Will Johnson being able to match up against Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, and actually pick like get a pick off of Marvin Harrison Jr. going up one on one against each other. Um, that's incredible. And that, and so yes, Washington has 
three and get give them all their kudos three exceptional top nfl level receivers but but it's not like michigan hasn't faced maybe the best in football um so there's the the fact that all of that kind of factors in i think to the uh, the number one ranking there and washington it just michigan could really have a field day as long as jj you know stays disciplined um you know michigan would really have a field day on washington's defense they they could um but you know again are they going to have the pixie dust or not nick, i think nick has a great point here by the way nick thank you for coming by and contributing uh a huge question is whether washington's o-line can hold up for four quarters i actually think they can um no no one has been able to all year against michigan largely because it's really difficult when you have tremendous depth as they have on the D line, this is a Washington's O line is legit. I will say that they are. Um, yeah, but so is Michigan. And so is Michigan's D line. That's why it's going to be really yeah. interesting to see. Yeah, um, and we're going to go into obviously you know each, each other's offense versus each other's defense in a second to really dive in a little bit further. But I think it's going to come down to the interior D line going after Penix. Um, so if you edge rush, Penix can get you by escaping and then like doing, doing magical things with his passing ability. If you go on the interior D line, he can't do it. He, he like, that's it. Right. So I think it's really going to come down to like the, 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 it's going to be the, the, one of the toughest games that our D line has had in their career. Uh, maybe the toughest to be able to stop Penix, but that's really, I think the secret. Uh, the secret sauce here um, because even though Washington's O-line did win the Joe Moore award this year, we also know that Joe Moore award sometimes, I mean, Michigan won in 2021 and Georgia had their way with us. Right. So, uh, you know, so I think the interior D line uh, might be, might be the top uh, secret there. Um, and here's where I'm going to give it to Washington, right? Special teams. And we saw it, we saw it against Alabama, right? Uh, there, there were some special teams miscues. Um, although during the season, they, they, in my mind, they were pre pretty solid in special teams. Uh, the Alabama game, I think, was rust. It was an aberration. Um, they're probably going to make some adjustments, maybe put Roman Wilson um, as returner um, instead of uh, Thaw or uh, Samaj. Uh, they, they, may, they may mix that up a little bit, I think. I don't know. Um, but Roman Wilson, I think, would be a great returner uh, for this game. And, and, you know, he obviously has that speed to be able to, to maybe even get a, a score um, when returning. So uh, I do give it to Washington, though. They just seem like they've got a lot more buttoned up on special teams. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you. But at the same time, like Michigan's, I think, are good enough. I mean, the question is, is Michigan going to make mistakes? I doubt it. Yeah, Stan, I, I think you're probably right. Um, special teams was an anomaly. Uh, and, and the good news is they have a week to get it right. And now it's a little bit more like a, a traditional week, week to week instead of this big break. So Michigan's a lot more used to that, right? Uh, now they can be dialed. They can kind of go back to that formula of, okay, we had the game and now we have another game a week later. So they can kind of have that practice schedule and, and, and everything to, uh, to get it right. I, I think, I think you're right, Stan. I, I, I agree with you. Um, and there's, like I said, there's nowhere to cope it up. So, uh, so I'm sure they'll make some adjustments and, and do that, uh, here. So, um, so we're going to, we're going to look at Washington's offense versus Michigan's defense. And, uh, so we'll start with, uh, with the rushing offense versus the rushing defense. So, um, like we said before, hundredth in the country for Washington, um, eighth in the country for Michigan. And we, we do have a situation obviously where Dylan Johnson, who I think uh, did very well for them in the, in the Texas game, um, you know, is injured. He's, he's supposed to play. Um, but I worry that it's going to be like when Blake Corum played in the Ohio state game in 2022. Uh, he said he was playing. He played uh, at two snaps because he couldn't, you know, he couldn't, I, I don't think that Johnson's going to be as much of a factor in this game. I give the decisive advantage uh rush o versus d to michigan in this one what do you think tony i agree with you completely michigan's rushing defense is really good the question is can washington's defense be good enough or can washington's rushing offense be good enough 
they're not going to they're not going to be great. But can they be good enough that then Washington can do what they need to with, you know, their nightmarish receivers and Michael Penix doing his like archer move? Uh, that, you know, the question is, can they be good enough? And I think we're going to we'll see. Uh, B Bean. Uh, so the backup is Will Nixon. Uh, so Will Nixon, uh, kind of a hybrid running back wide receiver. Uh, he's pretty good. Uh, red shirt, red shirt, sophomore looks like, um, you know, he's, he's decent, but, but I just, I don't know if he has, he has that same big playability. Um, so if Johnson's kind of limited, yeah, he's going to have to play. Uh, cause yeah, I, 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 I foresee a lot of Nixon and, uh, you know, there John's going to try, but you know, when, when you're, when you get injured like that and we saw what happened, um, a week is not enough time. And I, I do not think he's going to be anywhere close to a hundred percent. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, yeah. And, and here we go with obviously the, the, uh, the, the passing offense. And, um, and even though it's one, two, you got to give it to Washington. Washington's passing offense is, uh, one of the best I've seen, um, ever. Uh, it's really good. It's, I think it might even be better than Ohio state 2022. Um, just with the, the ability of all three of them, uh, to, to make those plays, um, you know, whether, you know, whether it's uh, a Dunze, whether it's Polk, whether it's McMillan, so Odunze, good. Odunze, uh, Washington fans were telling me might even be better than MHJ. I don't know about that. That might be homerism a little, I think, I think Martin Harrison jr. Is probably one of the best wide receivers we've seen in at least three years. Uh, he's that good, but, uh, j- because w- when he was out of the game, uh, you know, they looked like Iowa. So, so that's, <laughs> that's how much of an impact player he was. Um, so yeah, but it, number one in the country versus Michigan passing yards allowed number two. So could we see some interceptions from Will Johnson, Mikey Sanders, still Rod Moore? Uh, I, I think he might be good for one or two interceptions. But I still give the advantage to Washington. Yeah, they're really good. They're really good. And again, Michigan, because Michigan runs the ball so well, they haven't had to. They're very much the opposite. They haven't had to be that good. But these these guys these guys are lethal. But they tend to be lethal in explosives. So the question, you know, if you can stop the explosives or score enough that the explosives don't really matter, you know, I mean, I'm I'm sure they're watching a lot of that USC. Game. I mean, again, this is a team that scored 50 some points on USC and scored what like nine points on Arizona or 15 points in Arizona state and one with a pick six or, you know I mean? Just, so there's, there's a lot more inconsistency. If they, if they're on, they're on. If they're not on they're they're beatable. It's again, it remind it just, it reminds me so much of, you know, your game against TCU. It could be like your game against TCU or it could be you just roll them. Sorry, Erica, don't hate me. <laughs> um, you know I was rooting for you guys all season. Um, but but yeah, I just I that was the the closest. Wait, to, I mean, Ohio State I, scored three points. Can I give a personal message to our friend of the show, Erica? Yes. Ding dong, the witch is gone. There is a new era in Iowa offense, and I just want to give a huge shout out to Beth Gates, who did what no man could do in the state of Hell Iowa. Yeah. Hell yeah. And in her first year as an interim said, we're all done with this Brian Ferentz mess. Boom, fired his butt. Decisively, like, that. that is, there's like badass leadership case studies to be written about how Beth Gates fired Brian Ferentz. So Iowa fans, go Hawks. Uh... Herky was Herky has been avenged. Absolutely. Yeah. Great, great job. Um, and it, so, so just to, to wrap up on passing offense, I do think that whereas I think Michigan has a lot of paths and we'll get to this later, Washington, like Penix has to be on it to win. Like really, like we're talking 400, 500 passing yards, lots of throwing. Um, that's the path. That is the path. Michigan has like six. Washington, Penix has to be pretty much Perfect. a baller, which, by the way, I think it's very possible that he will be, um, you know, because of, of what we've seen so far. 
but uh, but you know that I, that will will kind of cover that more later. But um, definitely something to to look at as far as the different pathways to uh, to victory. So, uh, Tony, uh, we do have Michigan offense versus Washington defense now, um, and you know so this one, this I actually have a, a question mark and an exclamation mark here because I was a little surprised. Uh, that Michigan had the advantage here. So Michigan has the 71st passing offense in the country because, as we know, they they like to run the ball. Um, but they do, that, you know, they they have some great play action that they do uh, to the tight ends, Colston Loveland. Uh, when Roman Wilson does get into it, uh, the, you know, the, he he can run some great routes. He's taken a level up this year. Uh, Washington's passing yards allowed. I was absolutely like flummoxed at this. 120th in the country. One of the well, last part, in the country. Part of that is because I think their defense is not as good as a lot of other people think. Part of that is because they played some out. I mean, they played some outstanding teams in the Pac-12. They really did. I mean, you look at I don't. I don't. They didn't play Colorado this year, did they? I don't think so. I think they had Colorado off, but they played uh, USC. They played Oregon twice. They played Cam Ward. Uh, I mean. Th- there's a lot of those Pac-12 teams that don't get enough credit for being as good as they are. I mean, they just, they just played Quinn Ewers. So so they have played some outstanding quarterbacks that, I'll be honest, are a lot better than anybody you guys have played. Yeah. That, that's not a rib on Michigan. Just the, Washington has played probably Bonex. six quarterbacks who are better than anybody you guys played. Yeah, um, think who, that who was probably the best, Talia, Talia or Kyle McCord. I mean, yeah, exactly. Kyle McCord, who just got bounced to Syracuse. Um, so no you, now that's not a rip right. because again, Michigan can stop those, can stop people, and does stop people. Um, but you know, looking at Washington, Washington has definitely been. You know, now does that mean that they're more battle tested, or does that mean they're just not as good? It, you maybe both. Absolutely, um, Calvin. The reason is because I was surprised. I didn't, and here's why: they go up against each other in practice, right? So, so Penix and the offense goes up against the defense in practice. So you would think that they would, you know, have they have the ability to, you know, to to hone in. Okay, we have like literally one of the best quarterbacks in the entire in college football. Um, so they had all year to to practice against the best of the best, and they're 120th, and. So so I think I think that's you know, like you, you would think that they'd be able to hone that a little bit more when you're going up against somebody like Michael Penix in practice. That that's really why I was surprised. Um, and it means as we get to the keys to the game, it means that it, it, there might need to be like a Purdue esque or a, an approach where JJ is actually going to be slinging it a little bit, uh, which we've seen at times during Bama, at times during Ohio State. Um, and then the early part of the season, uh, before he got injured, um, that, that may be a large part of the, of the game plan, uh, to be able to, to beat Washington. I, they can do it too. Absolutely. Um, so Michigan rushing offense, 61st in the country, uh, Washington's rushing defense is actually not bad. Uh, according to the NCAA stats that I pulled, uh, advantage Washington with an asterisk. And I say this because of the eye test. I watched Texas run it down their throat. Um, they had a problem, especially in the C gap. I was looking at I the mean, C I gap. I watched USC um, run it on them, and that, that's not a good state of affairs, <laughs> my friends. It's not a good state of affairs. So so I, I, the numbers say Washington, but eye test uh, is a little bit more dubious. Um, it, it, when you have problems in the O-line, uh, it, like I said, I, I saw holes in the C gap uh, often but also just running up the middle uh, to be able to just basically run at will. Uh, I think it was like 6.8 yards per carry. Uh, that's it, I, Michigan could get eight yards per carry. If, if Texas can get 6.8, Mi- Michigan could get eight uh, with Blake Corum. So, th- so I'm, I'm giving it an asterisk. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Um, you know, their defense is not good. In, their defense is not that good. The question is, is, will they be good enough? Will they be good enough to offset what they're able to do on offense? Maybe. I, I, I agree with you on that. 
Uh, John, where are you getting these stats? So most of the stats are coming from the official NCAA composite. You can you can literally just Google NCAA football stats. Um, there's drop down menu. Stats.ncaa.org or .com or whatever. Com, yeah, I think it's com. Um, and you have the drop down where you can literally pull every single one um, for this. Uh, we also did get some from Pro, uh, Pro Football Focus as well. That, that NCAA site, you guys, if you're data dorks, like is awesome. Um, I, I randomly just pulled a baseball thing from there and like made it like a silly slide on Twitter today. And it got just directly from the NCAA data and it has like a thousand likes, like 400,000 views or something. And NCAA data is amazing. So just, yeah, you just pull cool stuff from there and people love it. Uh, we got a couple more super chats. So sorry, Nick, I did miss this one. Forgive me. Uh, Penix on throws under pressure completes 44.4%. Uh, I believe JJ's 56 or some somewhere in the high 50s. Um, so that's that's interesting. So you're both uh, good. Like I said, interior D line pressure uh, and edge too, but interior D line because where you don't you got nowhere to go if that happens and it happens quickly. Uh, thank you, Nick, for that. Uh, Ryan. If Michigan can stay on schedule with the run game and the D can get key stops, that's game. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Got to stop Penix at least a couple times or hold him to a field goal. So definitely a uh, spot on and there. Ryan, and I think Keith, you're totally right on that. Uh, and then Keith, uh, $10. I'm on a crusade to establish potential vice talent. Uh, but Bama and Texas had far more potential. UM and UW have more on-field talent. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, and then we, we saw what happened. Yeah, they, they proved it on the field, and Bama, Texas had the stars. And, uh, you know, sometimes it works out that way. All well, right. The other thing that I would add is those yeah. are two great games. Yeah. Oh, 100%. You know, either, All time. Any of those four teams could have won. There was no stomping in either of those games. So I, mean, I, I think you were looking at four really great teams playing each other. I mean, I think if you, you could add Georgia could have been another one and, you know, could have done some similar things in there. Um, and, and you really, uh, at least I, I, I feel like you, I mean, Mizzou, Mizzou looked really good. So that, you know, there's a lot of these teams that, that could have been really good. And one of the things like we talked about earlier, you know, we're seeing a little more democratization of talent. I think it's, it's good for the game and, uh, Absolutely. both these teams have a lot of talent, and one of them is about to be the next national champion. That's right, and it's very exciting. First time since either 91 or 97. Um, and now we put it all together, Tony keys to the game and predictions. And so, like I said, um, you know, the, I, I think Washington has literally won if Penix absolutely just crushes it, goes for 500. Um, and their defense is good does enough. enough to just contain, um, maybe get a pick, uh, maybe get a, you know, just keep them to a couple of field goals. Um, you know, Michigan has staggered at times uh, when when faced, even with not so great defense, they, they sometimes will sputter um, and get off rhythm. So that to me is the one key for Washington. Uh, is there one that I might be missing? No, I mean, I think that's it. The question is for Washington. Their offense has to be lights out. They've got to get those explosive plays. They've got to have those, you know, 60-yard touchdown passes that, you know, Michigan can't stop. And their defense has to get stops. They need to get probably turnovers. I mean, this is a game I think turnovers are going to be key in. If you can get a couple of picks, grab a fumble, you know, do whatever, turnovers could determine this game. Um, but – and you know, the question is, can Washington do lights out and be, ju be just good enough on defense to make it happen? Sergeant Pickles. We got our, we got Sergeant, one of our Sergeant Pickles, friend of the show, gets a dubs up. Absolutely. Uh, thank dubs you. Up, thank Sergeant you, Sergeant Pickles. Pickles. I can't, I can't do it since I'm rooting for Michigan uh, this, this, this time, but, uh, but we always appreciate you supporting all of our different shows and it, it really means a lot. Um, if you have any other keys you want to, you want to add, feel free to, to post 
Um, but yeah, the one that I, I, I saw was just uh, passing the Washington's passing game, just absolutely uh, crushing it. Meanwhile, Michigan's paths. So number one, the defense picking Penix off. That could be one. Pick a couple it, of them is, off. You, know, you just need pick, like, pick, you know, a couple of picks. Um, you know, JJ could, you know, Blake Corum could go for 250 rushing yards, uh, not just up the middle, but off the perimeter. Um, zone read, like read options. They do a lot of split zone, um, things like that. I could see Donovan getting Donovan Edwards getting in, um, and not just the run game, but the pass the pass game as a slot receiver, having both of them on the field. That could be a thing. Um, you've got Roman Wilson, who's your deep ball threat. CJ uh, Cornelius Johnson, who's more of a 10, 12 yard threat, occasionally can be a deep yard threat, but he's more used as a, as a shorter threat. And then of course you've got Colston Loveland who, uh, who JJ trusts implicitly. Those two are in lock. Uh, so when, when JJ throws Colston catches and Colston's bailed us out of a couple of situations that I thought were going to go and ended a punt on third down. And they, they ended in a first down Colston's been really clutch uh, throughout the game. So use of tight ends, um, Tyler Morris, unsung hero, uh, made a huge play against, uh, uh, Bama and obviously Tyler Morris and JJ, uh, play together in high school. So, so those two have the, the chemistry, um, in terms of, uh, receiver ability. So, um, you know, there's, there are quite a few, um, but basically like contain Penix enough, keep him to like 300 passing yards, three touchdowns and, and then use your run game, uh, you know, milk the clock a little bit, use your run game, play action to tight ends, um, and and uh, occasional deep shot. I'm, I'm giving this to Michigan, a big surprise, uh, 34 to 23, um, because, of the, because of the fact that I just, I only see one path for Washington. I see like six or seven for Michigan. Um, the, the difference in all these different aspects to me is just too much. Um, and they have a week to get to tune up the things that they messed up on last week. Um, 34, 23, Tony, what's your take on, on, you know, the, on Michigan's keys and then just kind of your predictions. I, I, so I agree with you on the keys, of the game, you know, can yeah. the keys, of the game are going to be winning the turnover margin. The keys to the game is going to be, can, can Washington do it? Can Washington keep that magical pixie dust going to win? Cause they, they could. But at the same time, Michigan is probably their worst nightmare in a team that is so good on defense and so good on offense, but not relying on explosives. Just, you know, very much a pound the ball up the way and go. So, you know, the, the question is, can 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 they have that magic keep going? I, it's possible. It's very, very possible. Uh, I am not putting down any money on this game. Uh, and maybe I'm a homer. Maybe it's because Coach Carr gave my dad's induction speech into the Coach's Hall of Fame. Uh, maybe it's because when they would want to talk to my dad about like Wisconsin tight ends, they would put me on the recruit list at in Michigan, and I would go and stand there like pretend to be a recruit. Coaches would talk to my dad about game strategy, but this is a national championship game, and sorry, dogs, but. Hail, hail to Michigan, the champions of the West once again. If I had to make a pick, I would say Michigan 34, Washington 31. Go Blue. All right. So so in, in your case, Washington would cover. In my case, Michigan would cover. So if you're if you're doing betting. Who knows? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to see here because, again, Michigan's defense is so good. Uh, and, again, Washington – they have that magic. Can they keep that magic going? If you know nobody, nobody come. I'm not. I'm not putting a dime on this game. So nobody come back and say, "Oh, you were wrong." Because I would say, don't bet on this game. Just enjoy this game. People are going nuts. Uh, extremely happy at your prediction. Hey, I grew up in I think, Midland. I think they were. I, I want to thank. What, were like, what's this, I want to thank Campus Corner. You know the Campus Corner store for <laughs> serving, you know, selling to me at like age seventeen. I want to thank the Sangria place right by South Quad, who would sell like pictures of Sangria to sixteen-year-old me. I, I appreciate that. So <laughs> I, I can't pick against that. And we got oh yeah, kicking chicken, go blue. 
We always love kicking chickens stopping by. Um, Moose, friend of the program, mod, uh, great guy, uh, follows recruiting. If you don't, if you don't follow his uh, Twitter, you should because he is he gets into recruiting like few others. Um, five bucks super chat, John. The key is clock management. I don't think Wash can stop our runner pass game, and being on the sidelines is a disadvantage for Penix and Washington. Yeah, huge time of possession. Again, that's again, it. that's that's what happened in the USC game is they just decided no one was well, actually. I think Washington made like two tackles, and so they won the game. Other than that, no tackles, just back and forth, you know, five second drives pretty much. And I don't think Michigan's going to do that. And that that defense that leaves the opportunity to create turnovers, to stall, to stop. Um, you know, again, which is why if I'm not betting on this game, I'm not making an official prediction. But if I had to, uh, I, I think Michigan finds a way to make it happen. Well, I'm I'm doing the I am doing official prediction 34 23. Uh, Michigan is going to get it hail, done. Hail to Michigan. Hail. That also, is. by the there way, was is. the very first real song I learned to play on the trumpet. Much to my mother's dismay, you had to learn had to hear it. Just to make it official, we're going to make a banner. There it is. Okay, because that way nobody can... I like it. Can, uh, go, you know, we, nobody we, can question we, we, it's keep there. It, keep it on. Keep it on. Um, so, Tony, I, you know, we always appreciate you stopping by and doing doing all the things with Voice of College Football that you do. Always. Um, so, as I do for everybody that I, I talk to, final thought, and where could people find you on the internet? What a great season. Uh, my final thought is I'm excited because as of now, uh, USC and UCLA and Washington, Oregon are in the Big Ten. Again, I grew up in Michigan. My dad played for Duffy. I think this is exciting and awesome. So uh, you can find me. You guys just follow, you can find me on Twitter at TJ Altimore. Uh, hit me up anytime or, you know, here in the Voice of College Football community. Great to great to interact with you guys. And uh, what a great season it's been. And looking forward to an even better one next year. Fight on. Absolutely. Fight on. Go blue. All those things. Thanks. By for the way, here, next Tony. conference game. You know who, what the next conference game is for these two teams, right? at each other the next conference game is usc at the big house oh that's right that's right how, how great how great is football guys that's gonna be amazing that'll yeah, be that'll be one one for the ages um who, who knows i mean it's a we may have like half a half a team half a, and then a bunch of freshmen uh who the, who knows who knows? Uh, you Who know? knows? <laughs> so we'll see where we're we'll see where we're all at in 2024. Uh, let's just win the whole damn thing, and then we'll uh, I like worry it. about 2024 after. Uh, but Tony, thanks thanks for joining us for Michigan Wolverines Live. And thanks for coming by. Fight on. We'll see you soon. Later, Tony. Um, so real quick, we're just gonna wrap up here. Do a couple of last comments. LBC Rob, thank you. Love you back. That's amazing. Uh, we of course have George here, who uh, is, is, let's just say is not rooting for Michigan. Um, but we appreciate you stopping by anyway to support us. Dependent fanatic is here. Big Ten baby, absolutely. Uh, Jim R. Really appreciate that. Uh, yes, Tony is awesome. No question about that. <clears throat> he brings a lot of insight, and I wanted to, especially since he hosted the Pac-12 show this season, he's watched Washington really closely. Um, I thought that was a, a <clears throat> really glad he was able to join. Since I was unable to do Tuesday, that's why we have this show, uh, which actually turned out to be pretty good. So, all right, everybody. Um, as always a reminder at on your way out, please hit the like button. Um, I'm going to send everybody to the USC show now. Um, so we've got the conquest call in show is happening right now. 
I'm going to put it right in the in the chat for everybody. Uh, no excuse. Go on over. Conquest call in show. Um, so they're taking callers. Eight 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 nine nine Riley um, over there for the uh, the Conquest call in show. And you can go and and support that if you'd like to. Um, hit the like button, please, on here. Subscribe to Michigan Football at the Voice of College Football. Um, we are trying to beat Ohio State for subscribers. Okay, we're a little behind, so please go ahead, go right over to the Michigan channel and hit subscribe and hit the bell. Okay, um, because the Michigan channel, we want to grow it. Uh, I have great ideas that Mark and I, Mark, Mark and I, are in the lab, and we've got some really interesting ideas. Um, we've got Dennis Fithian coming back on Tuesday night. Uh, so we've lined Dennis Fithian back up for the next show. Maze and blue review. A lot of, you know, him, uh, so he'll be on our next Michigan Wolverines live show. Um, I plan to do something for right after the game as well. Uh, Mark and I will sort that out. Uh, B bean. I, uh, I posted it, but I'll post it one more time. Sub to Mish channel. There it is. So I put it in both chats. <clears throat> put it in both chats for you. Um, no surprise, Porter says there should be an asterisk next to whoever wins. Porter, we beat an SEC team. We beat the GOAT. So there you go. We beat the GOAT. And Texas is about to be an SEC team. So Washington beat them. So if Washington does beat Michigan, they beat Texas. It's pretty good, right? Go blue, Tom. Go blue. Will and D. Great show as always, John. Will, thank you for coming by and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Um, okay, everybody. So one more time. West Collins show <clears throat> happening now. My voice held up almost the whole show with no issues, and now it's starting to hit. Uh, it's the uh, you know still still under the weather a bit, so forgive me. Um, but here it here it is, Conquest Collins show, and I will see you guys Monday night uh, after the game. And until next time, for everybody here at Voice of College Football. Michigan football, the voice of college football. I say to you all, go blue. And let's have a great game and let's go win the whole damn thing. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>